to see just how much interest there is. Um, Andrew, do you want to kick us off? Okay, I've just hit record. I'm assuming you've seen a prompt saying I've hit record. Good. All right, so thank you for joining us for this webinar. Um, as Tom mentioned, had I known Tom was going to say all of that, I would have hit record 30 seconds earlier, but there we go. Uh, this is a, an opportunity to um, hear about open source program officers from Saeed Chowdhury, uh, who uh, is here, well, for a variety of reasons, but in part because he's director of the open source programs office at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, I've known Saeed for 20 years now, I reckon. Um, we first bumped into each other in the institutional repository space uh, when David Gronowegan was also involved. David seems to have vanished, but never mind. Um, so Said has been working in the intersection between scholarship and technology for a very long time and brings deep experience and deep knowledge uh, to bear on the space. Um, but in this particular context is uh, most relevant because of his direct work with open source program officers. Uh, I've given Said a bit of context so he understands where we're coming from. Uh, we've got 11 participants on uh, the webinar, so I'd, I'm very happy to keep it fairly interactive. But maybe if we um, give Said a chance to provide some introductory material and then we can dive into a conversation about particular issues. Uh, over to you, Said. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, thank you for the uh, opportunity to be here. It's great to chat with colleagues in Australia. Um, Good to see Andrew and Tom uh, and David and some new faces. So hopefully we'll get to know you a little bit better as well. Uh, I do hope this is interactive. The last thing I want to do is talk at you for <laughs> 45, 50 minutes. So please do jump in with questions, uh, either you know raising your hand or going off audio or in chat uh, as, as I move along and I'll do my best to address them. Um, as Andrew said, I think some some introductory or contextual remarks may be useful uh, in terms of the OSPO landscape in the United States, uh, how it's come to be, and uh, the questions around open source software. So I, I often begin by mentioning, uh, thinking about all software, not just open source, um, depending on which recent reports you believe, anywhere between 95 to 98% of all software uh, is reliant on open source software in some way or another, either consuming open source modules, uh, for example, or being released uh, as open source itself or, or both. So when a lot of people come to me and say, you know, I don't know if my university is producing open source software or using open source software, I take a step back and say, does your organization have any software whatsoever? <laughs> um, and if it does, chances are there, there's at least open source embedded in it or it could potentially be released as open source. And that tends to make people think, oh, wait, yes, of course, we're producing software or using software in some way or another. Another important dimension to that is the assertion that software, open source software, is a primary research object. So a lot of the policies that have been developed in the United States over the last decade or so, uh, particularly at the federal government level, which of course influences the funding, funders, both federal and private, have moved in some sense from articles to data to software. So the first set of public access memos, if you wish, uh, to call them that, focused on open access to articles and then moved progressively toward the data that are cited by those articles or that are necessary for reproducibility and so on. And then now are getting around to thinking about software itself. So the, the Office of Science and Technology Policy in the White House uh, issued a memo last year uh, that is an update to the public access memo that came out over a decade ago. And I spoke with one of the authors of that memo, and he said in the earlier versions, they had mentioned open source software specifically. Uh, but getting feedback from some of the funders and some of the universities, everybody said, yes, of course, it's important, but we are not ready. Uh, we, we do not know what an appropriate set of policies would be around open source software, we don't know what the appropriate infrastructure might be, we don't know what those social norms are, and so on and so on. And the last thing we wanna do is create unfunded mandates or set out policies that make it difficult for funders and universities to respond. And by the way, can you help? Can you help us, in fact, to inform the update uh, to this policy as we think about open source software? So at least in the US, there's recognition of its importance, um, its role in supporting open science more broadly, 
Uh, and there's an understanding that university funders need some time and some dedicated effort to become better organized around it. And that an OSPO or an open source program office or a network of them can be a wonderful way to do that. Uh, one description I've used for an OSPO is an organizational API. Um, no matter how large or small your organization might be, if someone is interested within your organization about knowing what kind of open source activity is happening, where does one go uh, to ask that question? And for those of and anyone who's outside of your organization that wishes to interact with the organization, again, can, can the OSPO become that organizational interface that allows them not to have to deal with all the complexities of the internal workings of your university, your museum, or whatever it might be, but rather just say, I'm interested in open source. Can you help me navigate that landscape? And the last thing I'll say about context and background is uh, I, I, I've only been at Carnegie Mellon since last August. Uh, Andrew and I met when I was at Johns Hopkins, where I worked for many, many years. And I was a member, uh, I, I led the library team that supported the uh, Johns Hopkins Global Dashboard, uh, COVID-19 Dashboard. And it is cited, rightly so, as a, a real success story and celebration of open science. Um, proud to say that I was the initially lone voice <laughs> that said the data should be licensed using a Creative Commons license. Uh, and some people said, what is that? Uh, but we moved fairly quickly toward using that kind of license, which I think was important. But I've also heard from a lot of the medical researchers at Hopkins in terms of the vaccine development, that it was still difficult to share data with each other. <laughs> um, there were still patient records and so on, even if the federal government said everybody be open and access to articles was made much more freely, it still wasn't easy to share data. Uh, but by sharing code, they were able to infer what kinds of data <laughs> they were using and what kind of analysis was being used. So it was a clever and more rapid kind of workaround um, from trying to, to, to share the data. And I say that to point out that for all the things I've talked about in terms of the federal landscape and universities thinking about research objects, Open science is a good thing to do, period, right? Uh, and what we've heard is, well, of course we wanna do that for COVID, but what we're also hearing now is, well, we wanna do that for cancer and heart disease uh, and diabetes and all sorts of other medical issues. Uh, we wanna do that for climate change, for food insecurity, for you know, electrification, decarbonization. Why can't universities do this with all these other global problems that we, we have yet to address? And I don't think universities, at least in the US, will have the luxury of saying, well, that was COVID. And we did all that for COVID, but we don't really want to be open uh, for all these other types of things. So I think this is a one way street. Uh, we will find more and more funders insisting on this, more and more policies around this. And I think that open source software is a key component in any of these kinds of conversations moving forward. So let me take a pause there in terms of context background. I obviously don't know the Australian context and background, uh, certainly nearly as well as any of you. So I'd be happy to take questions or, or, or you know, hear your comments about that before I move more into sort of OSPO, setting up an OSPO. Maybe I can comment to kick us off. Um, sure. I don't think that we have as strong a policy environment. Um, but uh, it's always important to remember, I think, with this this particular problem, it, it, there's a there's a, a few different types of policy, um, and it it seems unlikely to me that uh, a kind of uh, mandating particular behaviour, um, uh, that kind of policy is going to happen in the Australian landscape, uh, all that so, uh, all that soon. But there is a type of mo uh, a type of policy that captures norms as they emerge, and mm -hmm the important thing to keep in the back of our minds as we do this is that this is already happening. Um, software production and use as part of research is huge. It's enormous uh, and it's not visible, um, but it is happening. And really it, where the change actually is, is an, is an understanding, characterizing um, and uh, amplifying the behavior that's already happening. Um, basically. And it's that, that is the precursor to the emergence of uh, normative policy um, uh, or an environment that supports it. So 
Yeah. Hmm. Okay, that's helpful to know. Now, just picking up on those the point about norms, um, one other observation I've made is that the norms around open source software are much more conducive to openness than they are around data. Uh, or certain, certainly around articles, if you think about the for-profit publishers and the role that they play uh, in that in that ecosystem, faculty members, at least again, at least in the U.S., are quite comfortable putting their code out on GitHub or GitLab or take your pick. Uh, they're quite comfortable, basically saying, "Sure, I would like people to see the code and to adopt it and to use it." That isn't true in a way around data, sometimes for very good reasons. Um, and, and and certainly isn't true around articles if you sign, obviously, the, the publisher agreements that, that the for-profit publishers wish for. So the other aspect of thinking about things like reproducibility, which is a key aspect of the policy development in the U.S., the code is critical for the reproducibility, right? I can read an article and basically gain no insight into how to reproduce your results. Even if you give me the data, it's probably not enough. Um, so having the code is really key for, for the reproducibility aspect, but it also lends itself to the kinds of norms that make it easier to share uh, and, and, to, and to distribute and, and manage the software in a collective way. Um, so let me shift a little bit to the OSPO concept, uh, which is something that's actually existed in the private sector for many years, uh, at least a decade, depending on who you ask. So we're learning and borrowing in some sense from that context. Um, I've been very fortunate to work directly with some of the people who started uh, earlier and even more recent OSPOs in the corporate setting. But even in a very early set of conversations, I, I made it clear to them that whatever work in the corporate environment isn't going to work in the university or academic sector. Um, we don't have a specific set of licenses <laughs> um, that we can compel faculty members to use. Uh, we we don't tell faculty members how to produce their software. Uh, it's just a very different environment. And uh, for most people, that was clear. But as, as we started going down this pathway, they, they literally said things like, well, what do you mean? What do you mean you can't tell them? This is the DevOps practice that they have to use. Uh, well, what do you mean you can't say these are the licenses? I said, you just can't. Trust me. It would be a very short, unpleasant conversation if you try to tell uh, somebody with, tenure, academic freedom, whatever term you want to use, that this is the way you will do it. So very sh quickly shifted to uh, best practices, right? It, it's that the private sector has developed a set of ways in which they develop software. And specifically toward more industrial scale usage, so large numbers of people, uh, and to do so in a way that fosters this sort of community development and, 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 and use. One person I've worked with for about three and a half years at this point, Stephen Wally at Microsoft, he's in the Azure office. He has this wonderful metaphor to cooking. Um, where he says, uh, if you cook for yourself, that should be relatively easy. <laughs> um, as soon as you add one other person, you know, you at least have to know what that person likes or, you know, their dietary preferences and so on. If you have a, a, a you know, a, a dinner for friends, family, same thing, you should probably ask, but you're starting to now harmonize the menu in a way that isn't specifically for one person at the time. If you're a caterer, you don't go to every person at a hundred person event and say, what would you like? How would you like me to prepare this just for you? And then if you're preparing food for a thousand people or 10,000 people, you certainly don't do that. So what, what are the metaphors in terms of software development? And you know, if you've ever been involved with software development, you've probably heard that phrase, it works on my laptop, right? What do you mean it doesn't work when you put it onto the production server? What do you mean when a thousand people use it, it didn't work? So again, not going to researchers, academics and saying, you must do things this way, but rather, are you interested in taking this software to this more industrial scale? Are you interested in other people being able to interact with the code that you produce? The answer may be no. There is a large amount of software produced at Carnegie Mellon that is used to train students, that is used to experiment on something that should never see the light of day. That's totally fine. But there are some subsets where the faculty actually say, yes, I do. I actually do want this to be used. I want this to be adopted. Uh, and if I can do things further upstream to make that more amenable, then, then sure, I'm willing to listen. I'm willing to work with you. 
So the OSPO's fundamental sort of mapping of that corporate role into the, into the academic sector has been, we can help advise you around best practices. We can connect you to tools that are being used by you know, thousands of developers throughout the world that will make it easier once you're ready, should you be ready to, to share that software, it'll be easier to make that happen. Same thing around license choices. Um, so we do work very closely with what's called our technology transfer office in the US. That is the commercialization type of wing in US universities. And I will tell you both at Hopkins and at Carnegie Mellon, the, the tech transfer office immediately came to me and said, are you going to tell everyone to produce everything open source and what licenses they're going to use? The answer is no, um, I, I don't feel the need to tell everyone <laughs> should do everything open source software. That's a choice uh, that someone needs to make, particularly because it involves some effort, right? So telling someone to do this and then having telling them that there are all these other things you need to do, it's not a good recipe. Uh, so working with tech transfer, what we basically argued is ultimately what we're about is impact. And I'm, I'm happy to say that the head of tech transfer at CMU when I kept saying translation, which is the term U.S. universities use to talk about research uh, being translated beyond the walls of the university, uh, I kept saying commercialization is only one form of translation, right? And he finally interrupted me and said, I don't actually use the word translation. I use the word dissemination, right? That, that is ultimately the goal of the tech transfer office. It's a different kind of dissemination, um, but open source software is a perfectly valid kind of dissemination as well. So. I'm not saying this is the case at all U.S. universities, <laughs> um, but it's a good discussion to have with a tech transfer office is that we're not here to compete with, you know, the things you're asked to do, <laughs> the metrics you're asked to work toward, but rather here's a different set of metrics that relate to open source software and its impact. Um, and mind you, this is not all just altruistic or, or, or sort of, um, you know, uh, high principle or however you want to think about it. One conversation I had within CMU, the president of CMU was present when the CHIPS Act uh, was signed at the White House. This is a major act of funding in the United States to focus on next generation manufacturing, semiconductors, so on. And the point I made to him was Carnegie Mellon can produce software in this realm that's relevant and we can spin off a company and make some money or we can produce open source software that impacts the entire sector uh, of manufacturing for say semiconductors or you know, metal refining or whatever you wish to call it. I, I had this phrase that I didn't really think it was that useful, but people seem to think it is, is that if data is the new oil, then software is the refinery, right? So if you produce software that an entire sector of the United States, maybe even the world uses, isn't that valuable to Carnegie Mellon as well? Uh, and he said, well, of course it is. Uh, I mean, that's the kind of thing I would take to a funder. That's the kind of thing I would take to, you know, uh, the, the representative we have in Congress and, and the Senate and so on. So it's a different kind of conversation about impact, social impact uh, and, and so on. So when that kind of conversation happens, you can start to see this inflection towards, oh, okay, maybe we should manage our software you know, more intentionally uh, and more strategically. And curiously enough, what I've found is that faculty are actually quite open to this. Um, I think many faculty have understood that they don't know a lot about private sector industrial software development. Some do. I met a couple of faculty members early on in Carnegie Mellon who had taken their software through the Apache Foundation process. They don't need any help from me, right? They, they don't need to talk to me. <laughs> they, they know what they're doing. They went to Apache, figured that out. That's wonderful. But they are the exception. They're not the norm. Um, the, the vast majority of even at a place like Carnegie Mellon faculty will say, I don't actually know, right? If I run this, you know, develop the software using best practices, I don't actually know the best place to deposit it. I don't know the best license choices, and so on. So it's fundamentally about a consultation in terms of what are your ultimate goals, right? Where are you trying to get? And what early decisions can we make that sort of make that easier or make it harder or maybe open up pathways you didn't realize or constrain pathways you didn't realize? So one interesting nuance that I've learned recently is um, 
people who want to open up their software, even though it's been closed or vice versa, something that's closed and open it up. License choices have profound implications for your ability to do that. Um, and they don't know that. They just think, why can't I open this up? Or why can't I close this? So having those kinds of conversations, I think has been really critical to helping them to think of the OSP as a center of competency, right? Not, not, not a center of excellence. That's a somewhat loaded term. And I don't necessarily believe the OSP is going to be a center of excellence. Um, but a center of competency implies you may have questions. We may be able to, able to answer them directly. Or we can connect you to other people who can answer those questions directly, or we can help you find resources that can help you answer those questions. So it's it's much it's very much a I'd like to do the following thing. Can you help me? Uh, and then just leave the choices to me. As long as I understand the choices and the implications, that's fine. So help me understand the implications so I can make better informed choices. Now, one related aspect is, to this is the organizational home for an OSPO. Um, I've been at two institutions where it's based out of the libraries. So I have that bias, I guess, if you want to call it that. But the reason I have that is it's fairly rare, in my opinion and my experience, that a faculty member will show up and say, I need help with software only. And I don't want to talk to you about the data or the articles or the open science or any of those other things or mentoring my students um, or so on. Typically, it's I'm trying to advance my research or I'm trying to teach a certain way, and software is a piece of that. So libraries in the U.S. have developed data management services, have you know brokered relationship with publishers around open access, or can provide consultation about looking at author agreements and so on. So I've made the argument that aligning that software kind of consultation with existing consultation around data, around articles, around best practices for open science is a natural alignment. That doesn't have to be the case. Um, the, there's another round of funding. So the first six OSPAs in the US have been funded by the Apple Creek Sloan Foundation. And they are going to fund another round next month. Uh, I don't know how many, but let's just say for the sake of argument, they double it. Um, my understanding is they are trying to look at some diversity of organizational models as well. Um, so not necessarily looking for all of them to be in libraries, all of them to be computer science. Uh, for research computing. It's early days for university hospitals. So there is not a blueprint. Um, you know, there are guides, there are recommendations and there are observations, but there's no, this is the way it needs to be done. Um, so again, let me take a pause there and see if there are questions or, or comments. Um. So I'm um, interested in your last comments there about the organizational position, I guess, is what you're saying. Yeah. What sort of <laughs> what sort of relationship do you have or do you see having with the university's central IT function? Because I guess, you know, one of the one of the things I guess I've seen a lot more in recent years is University IT is increasingly risk averse for all sorts of good reasons, right? You know, because yeah. lots yeah. of open doors into the university create cr lots of problems, right? So, so the things that make them particularly nervous is open doors that they don't understand. Yeah. Um, and also, I think, you know, in my time of universities, a push towards their main purpose in life is keeping the corporate governance systems going right you know if it comes down to um the email server is going to work or professor x's little bit of code is going to work they're going to focus on the email server right because if the email goes down the vice chancellor hears about it or the president hears about it if the if professor x goes down yeah that's a problem but unless the professor has a really good line to the president the president's probably going to hear about it so I'm sort of curious about what the relationship you see there from a, in that bit is and whether that, how that works for you and is the yeah. cause nervousness. Yeah. 
Yeah, so it's interesting to note that this is one way in which the U.S. and Australia are similar. <laughs> um, so uh, I, I do think there's another key relationship to have for an OSPO is with the central IT group. Um, that will vary depending on the nature of the institution. Um, I used to be at Hopkins, which has a very significant medical and public health enterprise, um, which Carnegie Mellon does not. So that has an impact in terms of the culture, uh, in terms of what central IT is worried about and so on. There are some broad general things. You're right. There's an increase in emphasis on security, um, on compliance, on all sorts of things that you know CIOs have to think about. Um, I, I actually remember talking to the CIO at Hopkins, interim CIO at the time, and well, you, your job is really difficult. He goes, yes, it really is. Uh, so I, I'm sensitive to this. I, I'm not trying to be, um, you know, uh, unfair in any way. But I, I do agree with, you know, your general characterization that central IT in some ways has had the proportion of academic kind of focus and interest and more corporate administrative, in case of Hopkins medical uh, types of concerns has grown over time, right? And I, I think that's just a reality. I think that's a fair statement. So in that context, um, you know, it's not to say a central IT group couldn't be the organization home for an OSPO, um, but I think, you know, my own opinion is having an OSPO outside of the central IT group that works closely with them is a better model. And the way that, you know, what are some of the ways that we can work together? So security is one aspect of that. Um, I don't think a lot of academics are thinking about security throughout their software development process. I'll just put it that way. Whether they do it at all or not, <laughs> it's, it's a fair question. Um, so a, a real conversation with a faculty member recently where I said, are you aware uh, of the US NIST, National Institute of Standards and Technology uh, Framework for Secure Software Development? He said, I, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> so, uh, being able to say these things exist, <laughs> You may want to look at them. You may want to consider them. You may want to think about the implications before you release your software to the world. <laughs> and you do so without a license, by the way. <laughs> it's very interesting implications on you if something goes wrong. Um, so central IT groups tend to be happy when they hear, oh, look, there's another group in the university that's reminding the faculty that this is an important issue. And this is something we need to think about. Um, I'll also say that, again, I don't know if this is common in, in Australia, uh, but in the US, some central IT groups also run the research computing uh, groups within the university. So that's another area where I think there's a lot of potential common interest and overlap between an OSPO and the central IT group. And um, you know, we're finding that this sort of rise of research software engineering as a role uh, in the US is becoming a, a much more prominent type of, of, of development. And I will say that I've spoken to the deputy CIO at CMU and had a very good conversation about what kind of services are we going to provide mm. around research computing and open source computing and do that together. And where we initially spoke about it, and I'm slated to speak to a group in July about this, uh, the Research Computing Advisory Committee, is the library is a good place to do sort of narrow, thin, large numbers of engagement, right? So training around Python, R, Git, so on, where undergrads, grads who know nothing about it can come to the library and learn. As you go, you know, sort of deeper down, or I, I said it was a set of concentric circles, right? Is as you get to these outer circles and Carnegie Mellon has a relationship with the University of Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center. Uh, a supercomputing center saying, hey, we want to develop these open source tools for orchestration of the workflows here. That's not something the OSPO is going to do. Right? So uh, as you get to these very specialized kind of needs, then it's probably more appropriate for a research computing central IT, so on, to say we're going to develop that, but in concert with the OSPO, right? Uh, and they're looking to us for help around things like Git training and so on. They don't need to reinvent that wheel. So it, it is very much trying to find at least some common points of intersection. And again, trying to make it clear that we're all trying to move in the same direction. We just have different levers and mechanisms to do so. Yeah. Oh, Nick, uh, go. I, oh, yeah. 
Oh, sorry. I was just going to say, no, I agree with you absolutely on that model of where the libraries will stops because I think there's a point at which you say, well, we're good at volume, but we're never going to have the expertise for sure. um, that really complicated stuff and it becomes very messy very quickly. Sure. But it, there's a meta point there to as well. The host within, if it's a university, and that's a big if because we're also considering organisations that are not universities, the, the nature of the service or the capability is going to match the what's actually possible with that um, that unit as well. Sorry, Nick, I saw you had your hand up though. Yeah, I'd be uh, I'd be interested to know how these OSPOs um, are progressing in the UK because they are much more advanced and there's much greater uh, deployment of research software en engineering groups within universities. And were so does it align more in the UK with with those groups rather than the library? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good question, uh, and you know, just probably not surprising. I don't know the UK landscape nearly as well. Um, I do have have had some conversations with people at a couple of universities, uh, one of them being Leeds, and with someone in JISC, um, you know, which is sort of the shared services group. I don't know if that's the right way of describing it in, in the UK. Uh, and I think that they're interested in thinking about OSPOs. My sense is uh, that the US is, is definitely a place where a few universities are going to throw something at the wall and see how it goes. Uh, and then everyone will learn from that and we'll, we'll come up with an approach. Whereas I think the UK and my, my, my limited understanding tends to be more, let's plan this, let's design it, and let's roll out a national kind of service. I don't think they're looking for each individual university to go off and experiment and, and prod around this. Um, I don't think it would stop them. And the, and the people in Leeds actually said, you know, if you're ever in the UK, please let us know. We'd love to hear you. Have you talked to our faculty and hear from you and so on. So th there's interest. But I suspect that interest will probably bubble up and, and just might say, let's create a national type of open source programs office or a, a, a network of that, which, I, again, I think that's a perfectly fine model. It's, it's impossible to do in the United States. Um, I, I remind everyone the U.S. is made up of 50 sovereign entities who increasingly don't agree on a lot of things. So it will be very hard to say, here's a national, you know what? Um, so universities are a good place uh, to, to do that kind of experimentation in the US, but that, you know, that might not be true in the UK. Um, so I see a question in the chat. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, was there more? No, uh, that's right. I was just going to direct you to Kathy. Uh, okay. If Kathy, yeah. you want to take the microphone? Um, sure, Tom, thank you. And uh, thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, to date, I'm getting a lot out of it. I, I want to be clear here. I'm here in a personal capacity. I'm not representing the institute. I have a long um, involvement with open source in Australia. One of the one of the key challenges that I see, particularly for a country which has, you know, a very small research footprint. We only have 40 universities. We have a, a scattering of research institutions. There are several efforts in this space already in the Australian landscape. You know, we have Carpentries, we have the Open Data, GovHack movement. Um, we have several sort of HPC uh, communities of practice um, that are, are doing excellent things. My, I, I guess the challenge that I see here is um, an OSPO is another actor in this ecosystem and you know, how might that streamline rather than sort of duplicate or proliferate some of the methods? Yeah, it's a very good question. Um, I think it comes back to that first or one of the first points I made about the organizational API um, in that if, if you're an individual in any one of these institutions that are being represented here and you have to figure out how to deal with your open source software, you'll do your best faith effort and you'll go off and do it. But if if one talks to, uh, you know, hopefully, if one talks to an OSPO, um, you can hear, oh, you don't need to take two weeks of your class teaching your students about Python. There are these carpentries that will help you learn about Python. <laughs> um, there are all these other resources you can use rather than doing it all yourself. And maybe this is the US mindset, but most researchers will poke around, will try to find some help. 
And then eventually conclude, I'll just do it myself. I'll just figure it out. I'll help the students do this. So fundamentally, what we're hoping people start to realize is the OSPO. And then, you know, I, I guess I'm, you know, I said it was last August. I'm coming up on a year at Carnegie Mellon. But I'm already encouraged to see a number of faculty who've reached out and said, hey, I heard about this OSPO thing and we've been using open source. And can you help me? Um, and, you know, the answer is always yes. We'll do something to help you. But, but again, the answer may very simply be, there's this external resource you really should go look at. Uh, you, you don't need to do it on your own. And quite frankly, neither do we, right? Um, but I will also say that it's not one directional sort of passive. Um, one thing Carnegie Mellon Ospo is doing is working with somebody in the private sector in the U.S., somebody named Dwayne O'Brien, who's a very well-respected leader in the open source tech world, at least in the U.S., uh, about looking at the Carpentry's current training for Git and evaluating it and either seeing are there things we can add to it or is there a second you know, stage of training and so on. So we're also contributing back, right? We're hearing that students take this and they don't necessarily feel like they can actually work with it. You know, how, how do we improve that? So I think it's a two-way exchange. And I think particularly a network of OSPOs could be a really powerful two-way exchange. It's one thing for CMU faculty your students to say, we're struggling with this. It's another for 10 universities in the US to say, we're struggling with this. Uh, and then I'm, you know, I'm, I'll speak for the Carpentries or any organization for that matter outside of CMU, but I would think they would be much more compelled by hearing, oh, 10 of you care about this. Sure, let's do something together. Um, Saeed, I've just noticed we've got 15 minutes left. Did you have other slides you wanted to present or are you just happy to let the conversation run? I'm happy to let the conversation run. It really would be best to hear from all of you about what would be most useful. Yeah, I was hoping to kind of, uh, it's a little bit Dorothy Dixer. Actually, that's a very Australian um, uh, term. Uh, it's a question in parliament from the same side of the government. Um, but... Um, okay. Uh, but please, please tell us about your latest wonderful initiative at length. That kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. Uh, so to do one of those, um, I I wanted to go a little bit from the strategic and tactical down to operational um, to give people a sense in the room. Uh, for instance, how many people are usually yep. located in an OSPO? Uh, and bearing in mind that it would be different at a university versus, say, uh, sure. some of the other institutions that are coming here today. Sure. Uh, I, I can tell you that in the corporate landscape, the number I've typically heard of is six to eight. Um, but I will tell you that many of those are technical roles um, so that they are individuals who will work with code directly, um, who will set up software infrastructure and maintain it and support it. Uh, that hasn't been the role to date of the OSPOs within universities. So I'm, I'm not saying that could not eventually become um, uh, uh, the case, but to you know David's earlier question, central IT might say, why are you going off and building this other kind of team to do these things? We already have people and so on. Um, so not to rule it out, but I don't think that that's a, another case where I don't think the corporate hospital maps directly to the university one. What I will say is in these early stages, um, we're finding that the hospitals typically have tended to be one to two people. Um, now, we're all very fortunate in that we're getting funding from the Sloan Foundation, at least initially, um, as I'm sure is true with any funder anywhere in the world. They are also asking, what's your long-term plan? <laughs> uh, and the answer should not be, you keep coming back to us <laughs> again for money. So uh, part of these proposals, part of the planning, uh, and I'm, I'm happy to say as of July 1, I'm being moved off of soft money onto combination of soft money and hard money at Carnegie Mellon. So the, this is this is the trajectory that you know the Sloans of the world are hoping for that you prove there's value here and that your institution will step up and start to support them. The roles have tended to be you know sort of the that consultative you know advocacy um, you know connection type of roles right we we aren't going in and propping up student projects although we are supporting hackathons right. Um, if we wanted to get into that direction, then that would, you know, obviously entail more people. But whether that's people existing already within the organization or it's new people, that's yet to be determined. Um, I think a good metaphor I can give you is that in the U.S. academic landscape, um, the data management services groups, 
they span all the way from multiple individuals who will actually take data and curate it and add metadata and then process it, so on, um, to single individuals or maybe even a part time of an individual who, who, who does nothing but the consultative piece because they simply don't have bandwidth for more. Uh, I suspect we'll see something similar with OSPOs in the US, that there will be some quote full-fledged ones that have multiple people. Um, and then there will be some universities where it just isn't necessary uh, to have that kind of full team. And they might just say, you know, we just need someone who is keeping an eye on the open source landscape, can let us know what's happening and can sort of see what's happening with the institution and do that mapping. Um. Got another hand up. Um. Uh, yes, um, I just wanted to ask, and it's probably a question for everyone else. It's more about funding, given that Australia doesn't really have philanthropic donors or anything like that. How would how would we look at being able to fund something, especially in the library space where budgets are quite thin? Um, funding one or two people can be quite an expensive task for um, something that may not seem in the IT space. Well. It, for um, the IT departments to pay for because they're very open source adverse. So how is everyone going to be funding this if they were to set it up? Perhaps, uh, you know, as uh, a co-designer of a scheme uh, to, uh, in our words, co-invest into this space, um, I can jump in there. Um, I, we're not quite doing it at the scale um, or in the way that... Um, uh, the Sloan Foundation is doing it. Um, we want to kind of ease our way into this, and we also want to consider uh, a broader array of partners than um, uh, um, the, the Sloan Foundation is focused on universities, I believe, entirely uh, in doing this. But OSPOs yep. are actually present in um, uh, public sector organizations. Um, and we're specifically interested in uh, medical research institutes, um, glam sector, so that's galleries, libraries, archives, museums, producing software, um, and uh, NCRIS facilities uh, in this round, as well as universities, and really will be guided by where the weight of the interest is. Um, uh, but we see value in, in proceeding through the initial steps as laid out in the guide uh, written by uh, Saeed, um and um and also in uh in forming a network of people i noting again that said said that part of the real value in this is being able to talk to other ospos um about what they're facing and it means that you distribute the um the knowledge and the uh, the experience around that um and so we are looking for people who are interested in um in taking on this initial work uh, and to make that a little bit easier, we're offering uh, a co-investment um, in that uh, effort to reduce the cost. Uh, and yeah, in order to do that, I, I, I might just jump in with the bit that I would have wrapped up with. We are seeking expressions of interest um, in order to gauge whether there is sufficient level of interest out there. Um, the expressions of interest are due on the 26th, which is Monday. Uh, by uh, midday, and um, it is a very low bar, um, let me say, for an expression of interest. Uh, it is the digital version of raising your hand. Um, so we, we do need people to raise their hand uh, digitally, uh, please, um, in order to proceed. Yeah, and if I can just add, um, I, I was involved in setting up one of the first data management services in a U.S. university, one at Hopkins, and um, I will say that it took a lot longer to persuade the researchers to include the data management services in their grant proposals than it has with software. Um, that has happened. I've been included in three different proposals at this point to represent the OSPO, include the OSPO in their proposals. So there's there's a much quicker path I've found where researchers are saying, I need this involved. <laughs> in what I'm doing, and I'm willing to put in some funding into my grant application to support it. And that's actually the signal that led Carnegie Mellon to say, well, okay, I mean, that's great, but number one, you can't be involved in 50 different proposals. That's simply not reasonable. 
So we're taking this as a signal that there's value in this and that the research is needed and we need to sort of free you from having to sort of engage with all these different proposals one at a time. I will also mention something else within the, the expression of interest mechanism, um, uh, sorry, uh, request, um, is uh, that we're willing to consider possible partnerships in achieving this as well. So if resourcing is a problem, uh, there are some structures out there where this does make sense. Uh, there are alliances of universities. Um, there are um, clusters of NCRIS facilities. There are peak bodies that sit over the top of GLAM sector institutions um, that might uh, be a better place to host this out of. Um, and if you have ideas um, that you'd like to put forward, um, we'd love to hear them. David, go for it. Um, just to follow up on what Sage said a minute ago about the sort of sense that he has that it's it's gotten some traction more quickly than data management stuff. Um, do, how much, uh, I guess when you're establishing this, how much overlap has there been with your data existing data management services? So are you able to build on that brand, I guess, by having some of the same people or, you know, having that existing, here are some nice people who helped you before, Here's another service that's got a slightly different name. Um, you, you think that's been a, a that's a, a important factor? Uh, definitely. Um, so Carnegie Mellon Libraries has spent over a decade thinking about open science and has built a fairly substantial program around it. I, I know my colleagues would say we need more people and we need more capacity, but I, I think it's still a fairly impressive set of, of tools, services, and capacity. Um, the open source soft programs office is considered part of that, right? So faculty at CMU already started to think about when I care about open science, I know the library has some help. Maybe I don't know exactly what it is, but there's some help. And now they hear, do you have software as part of what you're doing? Yes. Oh, there's this other group you should talk to as well. You, you know, from a, from a research perspective, there isn't a hard boundary between data and software, right? It, it, it's not again, getting back to that day of the life of, a, of an academic, it's not like they wake up and say, today I will only deal with my data and tomorrow I will only deal with my software. Um, so the fact that that line isn't so sharp and, and, and clearly delineated helps. They just need help moving forward with whatever they're doing and it probably includes data and software. But another factor is not tied to any particular university and that is that there are a set of canonical licenses for open source software. Right? The open source initiative manages a set of canonical licenses that everybody understands, well, maybe not everybody understands, but everybody knows, uh, and you can ask someone <laughs> to interpret what it means from a liability perspective, from a sharing perspective, from a commercialization perspective, and so on. They're, cost, you know, they're sort of organized into permissive and not permissive and so on. We don't have that in the United States <laughs> for data, right? We just don't have that for data. So I was involved in very early conversations around data and there was this, this is obviously my own editorial view. There was a bizarre dance where the funders kept saying, universities, you go figure out your data policies. And universities said, funders, go tell us what the data policies are. And nobody put the proverbial stake in the ground and said, this is the data sharing policy. This is the data set of licenses we need to use. But that conversation I had with the Office of Science and Technology Policy, one of the first things I said to them was, whatever you do, point to the OSI licenses. Do not let universities go off and develop their own open source licenses. So I think that makes a huge difference, right? That we, we have that framework in place. It's tied to the fluid boundary between data and software. And it comes back to that question of norms, right? Faculty seem much more willing to get help or share code in a way that's not true with data. I think um, it's worth commenting too that um, a, a data sharing or developing a culture around data sharing is actually relatively young, but really yeah. actually the, the movement of open source software is much more mature. Um, much mature. 
and the nature of the object being considered is also different. I mean, they 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 are different objects under the eyes of copyright law in Australia and the US. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so one thing to be cognizant of as you leverage what you understand about data sharing um, and how that fits into a university is that you're coming from a different set of cultural norms right. that have emerged under this open source software um, uh, banner. Um, mm. I think uh, actually, I'm sorry, Myra, but uh, we're actually pretty much on I, time. I, uh, I'm okay with staying past the hour if, if others are as well. So I'm happy. People, I know people might leave, but if there's a question, I'm happy to address it even if it goes All right, them. good. Um, well, we might do that, but I would also give permission to people if they want to uh, leave at this point. The, this is being recorded. The recording will be available. Um, there is no FOMO uh, to be considered here. Um, yeah. We won't hide the link to the recording, I promise. Yeah, sure. Um, thanks very much. Just very quickly, um, my question is about what was put in to the chat by Kathy Reed. So it's a quote, um, software defined era. Um, I mean, it's this question for anyone. So uh, what's the reference for it? And can you please provide the context? Thanks. Uh, sure, I'm happy to take that question. And, and firstly, I apologize for it not being clear and not having a lot of context around it. So my, my argument is that we're in the era of software defined everything. So the asterisk in that comment is, stands in for everything. So we see things like software defined networking, software defined infrastructure. When we start to think about research engineering uh, in, in the university and research institution context, or uh, we're seeing a huge growth in software supported, HPC supported research, hence the need for growing research engineering capabilities. So my comment there is basically that um, open source underpins a lot of that research software. And so in a world of software defined everything, uh, there's an increasing need for open source capability within the research sector. Yeah, in the US, people use this term critical infrastructure uh, and it, it, software, open source software in particular is mentioned everywhere in that context. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, we might we might wrap it up there, Tom, I think. That's okay. Yeah, unless there are yeah. any more questions in the room, uh, we can go over time. Um, or uh, if you do need to run off to the next meeting, um, then um, feel free to do so. Um, I'm just filling the air uh, by talking now in case you've got that question. Um, uh, and otherwise I'm going to basically yes. launch in to say thank you very much, Said, for joining us today. Um, it's been Pleasure. great to actually um, hear how this works um, mm -hmm. and has worked and is working in the US. Um, and uh, so thank you for uh, uh, sharing your time with us uh, at whatever hour it is there in uh, in the US. Um, presumably, it's not too bad. Um, it's not bad. No. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, and I will have to wrap up by saying, please, to the Australians on the call, um, uh, it, the clock is ticking. We need those expressions of interest to proceed with this, even if it's a, you know, half a hand, uh, half a digital hand, whatever that is, something between zero and one. Uh, uh, we need that in by uh, for the uh, for the recording by the twenty sixth of uh, June, uh, Monday, uh, midday in your time zone, um, and uh, in order to proceed um, with this activity, um, which would be actually that we would be seeking uh, proposals um, based on what we get in terms of expressions of interest. Um, so um, please, if you're, even if you're just tentatively interested, um, let us know um, uh, so that we can uh, bring this uh, into reality in Australia. Um, yep. All right, well, in that case, thanks all. Uh, we will send out the recording and my thanks again to Said for staying up after 10 o'clock at night to talk to us. It was my pleasure. Thanks for
Thanks. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.